Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to tell you that I found a typo. I don't know if you found it too, but uh, I, I just found it today, so the typo is still here, but I corrected it in my notes. And uh, it's related to problem 3, 4. Okay? I'll, I'll go there in just a sec. First of all, uh, I updated the notes, and uh, I added a few things that weren't there on Tuesday. So yesterday I updated them, and I added this uh, workflow that we saw in class, if you remember. This is what uh, we talked over here, a general workflow to calculate horizontal stress. And I just put it in, in here in the website so you can take a look at it and access at that anytime. And if you apply this workflow, uh, you will get to a solution to similar to the one I show in this example. And the typo is right here. In, in this problem that we were working on, uh, you are asked to calculate the horizontal total stress. And in here, I missed a 23. So a gradient of 1 PSI per foot, it's about 23 MPA per kilometer. So here is a 23. So when you do 23.8 divided by, by 23, that gives you more or less 1.03. 1.03 times 7950, that gives you more or less that number. OK? I'll, I'll try to, to fix it. Uh, probably that will be uh, done next week, uh, because it takes me uh, some, some time to, to update uh, the website. All right. So but other than that, the problem should be OK. I hope that you worked uh, through the solution, and you will find a very similar problem in the homework. Other than that, I think we are good to start talking about reservoir compressibility. And this is another example of applying linear elasticity in order to predict uh, rock properties. So the first example that we saw was related to calculating uh, total stress. Uh, the second example that we're going to see is related to calculating what is the rock compressibility. And there is an equation that I'm missing here right now in my notes, but I'm going to write it over here. And this equation is related to pore pressure. And I pick this one. So here we're interested in talking about rock compressibility. Are you have you guys taken reservoir engineering two? Or I think in one, but more or less you have taken one, right? So most of what you do is about solving this equation, the diffusivity equation that tells you what is the variation of pressure with time as a function of the permeability of the rock, the viscosity of the rock, the compressibility of the system. And with that, if you write this in just one dimensions, you can tell what is the variation of pressure with time. So this one is called the diffusivity equation. And in this case, uh, this is in one dimension. Well, um, we're not going to talk about permeability or uh, viscosity right now. But I'm mostly interested in talking about what this is. And this is a, what is called the total compressibility. And this total compressibility depends on the compressibility of the fluid phase. And that compressibility will depend on the composition of your fluid, gas, water, and oil, and their corresponding saturations. And it also will depend on the compressibility of the rock. And that compressibility is very important because in some cases, it can be uh, quite useful. 
For example, when you do uh, depletion, uh, some of the fluid would be produced due to the compressibility of the rock itself. So uh, I have an image over here, I believe, so I have to draw it again. Yes. In this image, uh, what we have is a case of depletion in which we have a, a formation that you are depleting and because the pressure is going to go down and basically everything above the reservoir is going to stay the same and that means that the total stress is going to stay the same when you lower the pore pressure you're going to add effective vertical stress to the rock and that additional effective vertical stress is what is going to cause compaction. So probably by now we can start integrating these concepts of total stress, pore pressure and the resulting effective stress. So le le let me run this uh, again. Here at time equal to zero, this axis is time. Try to lower it a little bit. Okay, so here is time. And at the beginning, when the pore pressure is high and we have a given overburden, it will start to lower the pore pressure, but everything on top stays the same. Basically, you're not going to change the weight of the rock by depleting a reservoir. Uh, everything on top is going to stay the same. Therefore, the total vertical stress is going to be the same. As you lower the pore pressure, effective stress is going to increase and that will compact the rock. That will make it smaller. We are interested in quantifying how much smaller that, one, that rock will get. And that will depend on the rock ball compressibility. And our objective now is going to be to link that uh, rock compressibility to what we use in uh, in reservoir engineering, which is the the pore compressibility. All right, so uh, let me come back uh, over here. Um, in reservoir engineering now, uh, we can define what the pore pressure compressibility, um, the rock pore compressibility is, and that's going to be the change of pore volume due to a change in pore pressure. Basically, this equation quantifies how much porosity changes as you change the pore pressure. And as we said before, if you lower the pore pressure in a formation, you would expect the porosity to get what? Smaller or bigger? Any, any suggestion? So we keep everything the same, you lower the pore pressure, porosity would what? We'll, we'll get lower, right? And how much lower it gets will depend on this pore compressibility. A rock which is very stiff, if you lower the pore pressure, the porosity is going to change very little and, uh, and this value is going to be small. You have some other rocks that may be more sensitive and if you change the pore pressure porosity is going to change quite a bit. If porosity changes also that's going to help you uh, for example to produce more oil due to compaction drive. That's one of the drive mechanisms uh, for production. Alright, so let's see uh, how, we, how we can calculate this quantity which tells us the variation of porosity with change in pore pressure to something that we already know in mechanics and in uh, the mechanical properties that we have already seen. All right, so here in my notes, I don't have the, the derivation of this, but we're going to do it very quickly, and I'm going to add it later to my notes. I'm just going to rewrite the equation that, that we had before. This is CPP is the variation of pore volume per unit of pore volume 
due to variation of pore pressure, considering that the vertical stress stays uh, the same. And just let me check one more time over here. Uh, there is something else over here where a little bit more specific. Uh, if you recognize this, this is a horizontal strain. So that means that now we're also considering realistic conditions in which when we deplete, the only strain which is changing is the vertical one. The horizontal is not changing. So the rock is just going to compact in vertical direction. All right. And in mathematics, we, we do that by putting this as a quantity over here. All right. I'm going to make an assumption to go to the next equation. And that's going to be, let me write it down here. That's going to be that the change in pore volume is going to be equal to the change in the bulk volume. And what that means is that any change of porosity or the pore uh, volume, which is this one, is going to result directly in the change of the bulk volume. And that means that the rock mineral part is not going to change volume. And it's mostly any change of volume is going to be caused by loss of porosity. And sometimes that, that is true. It's a good approximation. But some other times, especially at very high stress and pressure, it might not be true. And then you have to do something else. Uh, but uh, now we're, we're not going to get concerned about that. And we'll just continue with the simple derivation. And if I do that, then I can write the same equation. Uh, but now, instead of dVp, I'm going to write variation of the bulk volume due to a change in pore pressure, considering these two things are uh, the same. Uh, and I'm going to do something else. Here, I'm going to add this term, 1 over bulk volume over here. And in order to, to do this, if I multiply times this a new term, I have to divide this somewhere else. And I'm going to add it over here. So it's exactly the same equation. The only thing that we have done is to add uh, this equality. But doing this is going to allow me to do two things. First, what is this term? Volume of the pores divided bulk volume. It's porosity, right? I'm going to write it uh, over here. One, uh, one sec. Hopefully by next week I'm going to have my my new stylus. So this is going to be porosity. And what about this term over here? Now this is going to be the variation of the bulk volume due to a variation of pore pressure. And from here, le let's add one intermediate step. What is variation of total bulk volume divided the original bulk volume? Does that ring a bell in your, in your mind of something we have seen before? Volumetric. volumetric strain, very well. This is a volumetric strain. So what you see in, in here now, this is telling you the variation of volumetric strain due to a variation of pore pressure. And that uh, term is uh, going to be related to the uh, bulk compressibility uh, of the rock. And that bulk compressibility uh, of the rock is going to be 
uh, this term uh, over here, the bulk compressibility of the rock, and therefore, uh, here in our notes, that this is going, we're going to call it CBP, where the B stands for bulk, and the P is due to the variations of pore pressure. So let me finish this. The pore compressi pore rock compressibility is going to be equal to the bulk compressibility uh, divided uh, porosity. But uh, what is going to be the bulk compressi bulk compressibility of the rock? C V P under these conditions of no horizontal strain is not other thing but the inverse of the constraint modulus where this one is the constraint modulus in which there is no horizontal strain and that means that if I have a rock it just deforms in one direction and if you remember uh, we knew how to calculate this constraint modulus this constraint modulus uh, we did uh, last class is a function of the the Ian modulus and the Poisson ratio where this is something like this let's see if I get it right Uh, here is where I will always get confused. Let me check my notes. And all right, it's that one. One plus Poisson ratio, one minus two Poisson ratio. Uh, one plus So now with this equation, if you know the porosity of the rock and if you know it's Ian modulus and Poisson ratio you can tell what is going to be the the pore rock compressibility a parameter that you're going to use in reservoir engineering uh, quite a bit typical values of this uh, pore compressibility go in the order of 2 micro sip for something which is relatively quite stiff to rocks that have a value of 30 micro sip for something which is or more up to 100 if it's a very loose sand you may have quite a bit of uh, compressibility where a micro sip means 10 to the minus 6 1 over psi okay um you're gonna have you're gonna do an exercise uh, related to this in the in the homework we're gonna get there in in just a bit but i wanted to stop a little bit on this constraint modulus because it is it is quite important uh to, to take a look at it and take a look at the equation and understand what it means if the poisson ratio is equal to zero what is going to be the relationship between the constraint modulus M and the Yam modulus E? They are going to be they are going to be the same, right? And that means uh, that uh, I hope that you can see that why that what that physically means. Remember that we are pushing in this case with the stress which is in this direction right vertical 
So if you push in vertical direction, but the Poisson ratio is zero, it means that it's not expanding to the sides. And if it's not expanding to the sides, that means that it doesn't mean if that it is constrained because the stiffness or compressibility is going to be the same. However, and now this is a little bit more difficult to, to run in, in, uh, in your head uh, and, and to see how much it impacts that, but if you have a Poisson ratio which is larger than zero, which is the case of all rocks, then the constraint modulus is going to be larger than the Young modulus because when you push vertically, the rock is going to ten tend to expand. But when it tries to expand, if it cannot expand, then that's going to make it more difficult to compress the rock. So for all realistic Poisson uh, ratios, the constraint modulus is going to be larger than the Young modulus. Or what is uh, the same, the compressibility in uh, 1D strain condition is going to be smaller than the compressibility of the rock if it's free to displace to the sides. So M is going to be always larger than the Young modulus for a uh, typical Poisson ratio, and this is because of the capacity of the rock to expand to the sides as you compress it in one direction. Okay, so uh, I propose that we skip uh, right now this problem and we talk about that when we get to the homework. You, you have to do one which is very similar to this one. Uh, it, is, it is quite straightforward, it's just two lines, all right? Um, do you have any question? Remember, in reservoir engineering, if you have a label, especially in your senior design class, if you don't have data about what is the raw compressibility, but you know what the Young modulus is, or you, or you know what the P and S waves are, the, the travel times, then you should be able to calculate that compressibility instead of uh, doing just a guess. We'll see later how to use wave velocities to calculate uh, elastic properties of the rock. Okay, uh, the next item uh, to talk about that is the general solution of a linear uh, elasticity problem on in general a, a mechanics problem. And for that uh, this, this equation may look a little bit scary and we're not going to solve it, don't worry, but uh, you, you should know it, it exists and you should know that this is the equation that is solved uh, in a reservoir simulator that has a geomechanics module or in a hydraulic uh, fracturing simulator that uh, simulates the mechanics part. Uh, this or a similar version of this is what it solves in in those uh, in those algorithms. Uh, I'm I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, right now, but uh, again, uh, we're not going to solve it. We're going to use just solutions for that. But remember, if you want to solve a problem like stresses in something which is a little bit more complex than the simple flat domain that we have or stresses for an inclined wellbore, stresses close to a wellbore, stresses near a fracture, then this is what uh, you have to solve. Uh, where was that? Uh, this one. And uh, usually you will do that numerically. But let me tell you a little bit about this equation, how we get there, uh, and, and then, then we'll continue, all right? Okay, so let me get here. A little bit more of space. Uh, the idea would be that 
for example, you, if you have an arbitrary domain with stresses in vertical direction, stresses in horizontal direction, uh, let's say supported on the bottom, and inside here you were talking about geological formation, let's say that it's also layered, and inside here we want to solve what are the stresses caused by opening a fracture somewhere over here and how for example that would impact another fracture that grows over here, over there if that's going to make it turn or what is it going to, to do now we, we cannot deal with the simple equations that we were using before which are just for a simple cube now we need to put all these little cubes together and solve this continuous equation about uh, equilibrium and uh, deformation uh, and stresses, right? Where our objective would be to the little cube that we we're working with, now it's inside a big domain and our objective is to solve stresses uh, in the little cube. And in order to do that, uh, we're going to use uh, that equation that I was uh, telling you before. I'm not going to show what the, the, the equation of that is, but I'm going to give you a hint about how to get there. And if you are interested, uh, you can take my advanced U mechanics class, and then there we see the, the full derivation of this equation. But again, it, it's, it's not too difficult. But I hope that uh, with the following explanation you will see the idea of something that you already know very well. And it's the same thing with mechanics. But l let's talk about an analogy, a fluid flow problem. What equations do you use for the problem of fluid flow? Probably the most important equation is mass conservation, right? Mass conservation it means that nothing everything that gets into a rock it has to get out unless there is some change of density. But uh, let's consider an incompressible fluid. If you have any change of fluid uh, flow rate, it has to cancel out with a change in another direction, where Q are the flow rates and X are the three directions. So that is mass conservation. And if you remember, equilibrium is not other thing but momentum conservation. It's a different type of conservation, but still it's a equation about conservation. And what else can we add in order to solve a fully flow problem? Probably you, your favorite equation in flow in porous media would, would be which one? the Darcy equation, right? so Darcy equation uh, tell us quantifies flow rate with uh, change of pore pressure and in three dimensions Darcy looks something like this the flow rates in these three directions are going to be proportional to the permeability of the medium, inversely proportional to the viscosity of the fluid, 
and they are going to depend on the gradient of pressure in the corresponding direction. That's a, that's an X. Let me see if I can fix it. Okay, X1, DP2, DX2, DP3, DX3. So you can put these two equations uh, together and obtain uh, the equation that uh, combines the two. So if you notice here, we know what each of these Q uh, flow rates are, Q1, Q2, Q3, so we can put just that in there, in the mass conservation equation. And when we do that, uh, we'll get that this is going to be the change in direction 1 of dp uh, oh let me negative k divided viscosity dp1 dx1 and basically all the other terms are the same but you just change the, the index right and if we consider that the permeability is constant we can take it outside and this is going to be just the second derivative of pressure with respect to distance two times and now I'm going to complete the other terms but at the end this is just a differential equation where pressure is the unknown that's what you solve for in a reservoir simulator and if you take reservoir 3 as an elective uh, you're going to write your own uh, reservoir simulator uh, with Professor Foster. He's going to show you how to solve uh, this equation, also adding the the time term. But at the end, you know, we, you just combine Darcy equation with mass conservation equation, and you get an equation that a differential equation that tells you what is the variation of pressure as a function of space. And here I'm missing a number two and a number two. Uh, but that's the idea, is to combine equations uh, so that you can get to a master equation that after you solve that, uh, you can solve your unknowns, which in this case are the pressures. Where with mechanics, it's exactly the same, but now the equations that we have to solve are not the fluid flow equations, but are the mechanics equations. And those mechanical equations are first equilibrium. If you remember, that equation uh, w was a long one with uh, the variation of the stresses with respect to, uh, to, to location or to distance to be equal to zero. I'm, I'm not going to write it because it's too long. I can write it. I could write a compact version, but that's going to be more confusing. But let's just write equilibrium here, which is conservation of momentum. That's going to be number one. Number two, these are going to be the kinematic equations that relate strains to displacements. And number three is going to be the constitutive equations that relate stresses to strains. So if you put number two into number three, now you can relate stresses to displacements. And if you put number three into equilibrium, you're going to get this master equation similar to what we did before, which is this one where our unknowns are displacements 
which are these uh, vector uh, vectors u and these inverted triangles are just derivatives derivative functions uh, uh, the the Laplacian operator or the gradient operator uh, don't worry about that if you want to know more about that just check this link on uh, Wikipedia and, uh, and you'll see what they are but I'm not going to take this in a test, don't worry. I just want you to know that this is a differential equation that puts all of those equations together. And similar to the equation for fluid flow, where the equation might depend on the properties of the, of the porous solid, in our equation of mechanics, uh, also we have parameters that depend on the properties of the rock where G is the shear modulus and lambda is the, the lame first parameter which depends on Young modulus and Poisson ratio and you can also put in this equation what are the effects of gravity so if you want to solve a complex problem like this one or a problem in which we, you want to calculate the stresses around the wellbore or around the fracture or, or something complex uh, like computing the state of stress a, around a salt dome in offshore conditions then an equation similar to this is the one that you're going to have to solve and again in this class we're just going to see the solutions uh, but in our more complex problems you may have to solve it on your own Okay, so that's uh, basically uh, most of what I wanted to, to talk about this part. Uh, I'm going to try to add a few more things uh, to this section, probably updated by next week. So you should have it over there. And now I'd like to talk about the homework. And if we have any time left uh, to talk about the, the next topic, which is we're going to skip for now because you don't need it for the homework but it's going to be important later on about rock anisotropy uh, plastic and viscous deformations so we're just going to skip that for now and go directly to the problems alright so this homework is due uh, tomorrow right question number one and number two hopefully uh, number one you have already done it uh, here I should have already fixed my typo uh, in the same graph plot okay radial strain yeah it's already fixed uh, is there any question with that one which is you tomorrow no all right the second one uh, the second one please uh, read my notes about this convention and uh, remember that this convention in geomechanics is the opposite to what you learned in solids and it is the opposite because in geomechanics compression is far more common than tension so in order to avoid dealing with all those negative signs in geomechanics we consider compression positive and tension negative because tension tends to be mostly the exception rather than the rule uh, and that's why in geomechanics uh, we deal with compression as positive so if uh, if you're checking you know some other uh, book which is not about geomechanics then you, you, you will find the the opposite so but, but don't get confused uh, in geomechanics remember that compression is positive and tension is negative all right and now we are into the homework due for next Thursday and this is the first problem number three in problem number three uh, what you have to do is you have to use the equations of linear elasticity in the matrix form stress equal stiffness matrix times strain to compute uh, what is 
the bulk modulus. Let me explain that a little bit more in detail over here. So this is going to be the homework. Okay, problem number three. I'm not gonna I'm not going to do it in three D because it takes uh, quite good drawing skills to do it. But I'm just gonna do it in two D. But this is going to be the same in 3D, okay? The, the idea extends in 3D. What you have to do is to apply a stress which is the same in all directions. And that one is going to be sigma, we're going to call it sigma iso, meaning sigma isotropic. When you apply a compression which is the same in all directions and your solid is isotropic, then you should expect the deformation to be the same in all directions. So what I would do in this case, I will use this equation, the one that tells me what are the strains as a function of stresses and this one is actually this one and notice that in this case the shear strains are going to be the shear stresses are going to be zero uh, so your input vector over here is going to look something like this. Your objective is to calculate epsilon 1, 1 epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 3, 3, epsilon 1, 2, epsilon 1, 3. Oh. And epsilon 2, 3. I'm not going to write the matrix, but the matrix it's going to be somewhere over here, 6 by 6. And your input vector is going to be sigma 1, 1. It's just going to be this sigma iso. Sigma 2, 2 is going to be also sigma iso. Sigma 3, 3 is all the same stress. And this is going to be 0, 0, and 0. And the objective here is to relate, uh, let me move this a little bit, to add all these strains and that's going to give you the volumetric strain and if you notice now your your uh, volumetric strains are going to be a function or each of these are going to be a function of the isotropic stress multiplied by uh, something in parentheses that includes the Young modules and the Poisson ratio so the, the final thing to do here is uh, to get to an equation that tells you what is sigma iso as a function of the volumetric strain where in the, what goes in here, a multiplied volumetric strain is called K and is called the bulk modulus. 
And the bulk module is, is what quantifies uh, the relationship between isotropic stress and volumetric strain. That's the first problem. There is something that I'd like to clarify here. I haven't done it before, but probably this is a, a good time to do this. Uh, if you notice, sometimes we refer to strain, and I write it like this. But when we started talking about strains, I didn't write this like this. I rather wrote this strain like a matrix, like this. And in the homework, I'm asking you to write it also as a matrix. They are the same thing, but I use sometimes, and you'll do the same, the matrix form, uh, I'm sorry, the, the vector form, because that's a lot easier to deal with when you do mathematical operations. If you want to relate a vector like this one uh, with another vector like this one, what you need in between to do this multiplication is a, a matrix. So this is a vector which is uh, 6 by 1, and this one is 6 by 1, 2. Here you will need a two-dimensional vector 6 by 6. So it's easier to write, it's easy to code, uh, it's just convenient. But uh, all the time we are meaning that this is actually a strain tensor, which is a matrix. But we don't use a matrix form because if we want to use a matrix form and relate a matrix to a matrix, we will need a four-dimensional factor in between two matrices, and that's a mess. I, I cannot write it on the screen. I cannot write it on paper. I need a, a four-order loop if I code it. So instead of dealing with that, we use this more convenient form of a vector to do mathematical operations, but we're always meaning, remember, that strain is a tensor, 3 by 3 matrix, the same with the stress. Stress is also a tensor. So, for example, in this particular case, that we're applying a isotropic compression from all sides, the stress tensor is going to look like this. All diagonal elements are the same, and if there is no shear stress, it looks like that. If I apply, I get the strain out of this, it only in this particular case, where I just have isotropic stress and no shear strains, that means that these shear strains in this particular problem are going to be zero, and the only thing left are going to be these diagonal terms. All right, so this is problem number three. And you have to solve it numerically and uh, with uh, some uh, given values over here. And it's related to the bulk modulus. The next one is about the constraint uh, modulus. And it's a very similar one, but what I want you to notice from this problem number four is that now you're going to change, you may think of this as changing your input, your strain, 
is going to be, let's say the axis 1 and 2 are horizontal. So this is going to be 0, 0, and here you're just going to have one strain this is going to cause a stress since the shear strains are zero the shear stresses are also going to be zero but the normal stresses will not be. Obviously, if you apply a strain in direction 3, you should get a stress in direction 3. But what is important to notice here is that even if you have a strain equal to 0 in direction 1, 1 and direction 2, 2, you are going to get also stresses which are non-zero here. And again, this applies for a problem in which I have an axis, let me see, one, two, three, one, two, three, where the deformation is only in direction three. and there is no deformation in the other two. Okay, so that's problem number four. And uh, one more thing that you have to do over here is you also have to calculate the compressibility. Uh, so if you know the Yam modulus and the Poisson ratio, you can calculate the constraint modulus. Uh, as soon as you calculate the constraint modulus, if you know the porosity of the rock, uh, you can also calculate uh, what is going to be the pore compressibility and I like that you convert also to uh, micro sip. And the last problem, it's a problem uh, very similar to the one that uh, we already talked about and, and solving class uh, using these tectonic strains in order to calculate the horizontal stress. <coughs> so I'm not going to, to go into detail uh, talking about that example right now because we have already done it. And again, just check this problem uh, three, four as an example of that. It's solving there uh, step by step. And remember about that typo that Unfortunately, I cannot fix right now, but I'm going to fix uh, next week. The here, this sh there should be a 23 right there. We're not going to show it in detail, but we're going to see. Oh, let me see if this works. Apparently, I ran out of time. Oh, no, it's not working anymore. No, it's asking me to do it again. Okay. I'll try one more time. All right. But basically, you know, this is everything uh, you need to do for uh, for the homework. So le let me take advantage of this time while, while this builds to tell you a few things. Uh, first of all, don't forget that your next laboratory is going to be next week on Wednesday. Uh, this is going to be a short one, and it's about tensile strength. And I'll cover that uh, on Tuesday. But I'm going to cover that remotely because I won't be here on Tuesday. So there is no lecture on Tuesday. And I'm going to send send you a video about uh, with a makeup a lecture for that. 
but uh, I, I'm going to a conference. Actually, I'm going to Galveston. I'm going to enjoy there the muddy waters of, of Galveston and uh, send you a picture from there. And uh, I have a conference about uh, unconventional gas from gas, hydrate bearing sediments. But I'll be back on Thursday, OK? So on Thursday, on Thursday we'll continue. But remember, on Wednesday, uh, you have your, your laboratory. All right, so apparently this is good. Now it's running. Let me uh, have plot the in the output here. And I think we already saw this example, but we're going to see it one more time uh, because now this is going to make a lot more sense. What you see over here, it's a code of this equation that predicts stresses as a function of overburden, tectonic strains, and the properties of the rock, Poisson ratio, and the constraint modulus. So if I come back over here, uh, in red, I have the vertical stress, or overburden. And in blue, I have the pore pressure. Notice that if the Poisson ratio is equal to 0, that means that the rock is not pushing to the sides. If the rock is not pushing to the sides, that means that the total horizontal stresses are going to be, l let me add something in between before I say that. The effective horizontal stresses are going to be zero. If the effective horizontal stresses are zero, that means that the total horizontal stresses are equal to the pore pressure. That's the case in which the Poisson ratio is equal to zero, but it's not realistic. Let's take the Poisson ratio to the typical value that we said before, 0.25. Now at 0.25, if you remember, we said that effective horizontal stress will be one third of the effective vertical stress. And this is exactly what you see here. The distance from here to there is one third of the distance from here, from the red curve to the blue curve. And the two horizontal stresses are the same. This is the case for which we say that we have a tectonically passive environment. That means that there are no strains in horizontal direction. And sometimes uh, you have cases like that, or close to that, in which you have this type of uh, stresses. Um, Actually, uh, the difference between the stresses, horizontal stresses, is very important in hydraulic fracturing because when the two stresses are more or less the same, the horizontal stresses, the fracture doesn't really know where to go because it will usually be perpendicular to the minimum horizontal stress. But if the two are a minimum, that means that fracture can go anywhere. So that creates a fracture which is a little bit less planar and can go in in different directions if the one of the stresses is not well defined. Being that there's no maximum, would the stresses then reach further into the rock? What were their fractures? W well, ac actually no, because for the same amount of, of volume, your fracture would probably, you know, go cur curve in one direction. It's going to be more tortuous. Yeah, yeah so it's going to actually reach further when it's just planar and goes in one direction. But you may have what is called a like more complexity near the wellbore, and probably that could be good for production, at least from the, the part which is nearest to the wellbore. But let me tell you, sometimes you can see something like this. This actually results in something which are called polygonal faults, which are faults that look like cracked uh, mud. You know, when you know when it rains and there is mud and then it dries and it cracks like uh, skin of an alligator, something like that? Uh, well, uh, like in hexagonal patterns, some, something like that also occurs in the subsurface with big faults. And those are called uh, polygonal faults. And that happens when the stress are more or less the same. We're going to see later that st when stress are very well defined, your faults are very well defined in one direction with some strike and with some dip. 
but when they are not, they just form in any orientation uh, because the stresses are very similar. But many times this is not the case. You at least have some small component of, of tectonic strain that makes one of them to be larger than the other. Actually, let me increase S22. Okay. So now if we have a little bit of tectonic strain, now these two stresses are different. And that's because we have more compression in direction 2 than in direction 1. The difference between two these two stresses, we're going to see later on when we talk about hydraulic fracture, is called differential stress. Uh, again, that's an important value because that's what the margin that you have for your s hydraulic fracture to stay more or less planar perpendicular to the minimum principal stress. If you make a fracture and you make your local stress to go over the intermediate stress, again your fracture may turn and go in another direction. And if you have more compression, more tectonic strains, you may have one of your horizontal stresses to be larger than the vertical stress. And now that's when you go into uh, a uh, strike-slip stress regime or reverse faulting. All right, so this is about the tectonic. I, I explained, you know, the influence of the Poisson ratio, the influence of tectonic strains. There is one more thing to take a look at here and that is the pore pressure. Let me come back to zero tectonic strains and to that case. We said that the distance from here to here is one-third of the distance from the vertical stress to the pore pressure. Well, what happens if the pore pressure increases? If we have cases of overpressure, like the ones we discussed before for offshore conditions, then your pore pressure will start to increase, but what you should keep in mind is that this relationship of the distance or this effective stress being one-third of the vertical effective stress is going to hold. That, that is going to remain the same. This one is still is going to be one-third of that large one, but in magnitude it is smaller, but in proportionality they are the same. And what that also causes, pore pressure being higher than hydrostatic, is that, let's come back to zero, or to hydrostatic case, you have quite a large effective stress over here. If you have overpressure, the absolute value of effective stress is going to be much smaller. And we're going to see in the next chapter that effective stress is very important because the higher the absolute value of effective stress, the stronger your rock is going to be. So that's going to be very important. If you are in conditions of very high pore pressure, uh, close to the vertical stress, your effective stress are going to be small, and your rock is going to be weaker as well. And this, for example, causes problems in, uh, in offshore uh, drilling. All right, so the last thing that we have to discuss is anisotropy, plastic, and viscous deformations, uh, which are these three uh, topics and the 3.7, we'll talk about that later on, uh, but uh, I don't think I have time for that today. And it's been a rainy day, cold day, probably you're, you're, you're hungry too, so we'll just, we'll just stop here. And remember, Tuesday, no lecture in class, I'll send you a makeup lecture uh, so you can uh, catch up uh, with the video, all right? And remember about your homework uh, due today 
and hopefully you already uh, submitted your uh, laboratory report. All right. Okay, guys. See you on Thursday next week. But you will see, uh, you will go to the laboratory on Wednesday, right? Don't, don't forget that.